No matter the situation, he always manages to stay relatable. He isn't just Spider-Man to us, he's Peter Parker. I'm so scared I can't even finish my lame joke. Or Miles Morales, or Gwen Stacy. How many Spider-Men or women are there? Regardless, we just want to be focusing on the former. Even though superpowers ruined his life, who wouldn't want to be able to swing through the sky? What's up, Pro Guys family? My name is Nathan Ng, and today we're gonna to be looking at the journey it took before fans finally got the perfect adaptation of Peter Parker. Spider-Man was never locked into a specific genre. His games moved from beat-em-up platformers to even text adventures, and it all felt natural. The thrill of being Spider-Man wasn't unique to any style of gaming because he was such a multifaceted character. He oozed personality, and each game was a developer's best attempt to bring him to life, even if you needed to use a lot of imagination. Spider-Man's first entry into the 3D world wouldn't come into the year 2000. At this point, Activision had just gotten the license to make Spider-Man games. They also contracted a studio named Neversoft to make it. If you look at their other releases, there wasn't really anything else like the Spider-Man that they've made, either before or after. They're really just known for making the Tony Hawk and Guitar Hero games, which is probably why he was in the second one. Neversoft played it incredibly safe. There's cutscenes throughout with professional voice work, a really good soundtrack, and a surprisingly good story for the time. It was clearly made for the fans, and they even got Stan Lee to do the narration. Rest in peace, King. Welcome, true believers and newcomers alike. Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee here. They hit on something major, though. The game constantly threw new objectives towards the players. Some levels you'd be rescuing the hostage, and others you'd be running free to life. It understood that to let the player believe that they're Spider-Man, you couldn't restrict the character to a single game type. A few years later, the Sam Raimi film was scheduled to release. Activision was looking for a new studio to make that movie tie-in game, and they chose Treyarch, a studio that they had just bought recently. Back then, it wasn't the powerhouse it is today, and they are most famous for, honestly, just porting other games. During the production of the 2002 Spider-Man game, a developer named Jamie Frischrum wasn't exactly happy with how the web swinging was implemented. He felt like it was flying with just cosmetic webs, and it was lacking that freedom unique to Spider-Man. When developments of Spider-Man 2 rolled around, Fristrom got his opportunity to flesh out the web swing. It was incredibly ahead of his time, especially for a movie tie-in game. Fans loved this mechanic. It's probably the most widely talked about individual mechanic in gaming history. I mean, think about it. People still talk about the swingy in Spider-Man 2 today. Imagine if you saw someone fanboying about the Sonic the Hedgehog spin dash. You'd probably think that they were insane, and rightfully so. Andrzej Pokrowski, a member of Frischrum's team, came up with the idea of using a technique called ray casting. Essentially, the game would scan nearby buildings for viable points to swing from. This means you could go around buildings, turn with no problem, and it was easy to insert these points anywhere. They captured momentum and gravity perfectly, and since it was just so difficult to master, it felt incredibly satisfying to pull off swinging. Just the addition of running on walls transformed movement in the air in general. But Spider-Man 2 wasn't just good because of that one area. Up until then, it was probably the most polished superhero game of all time. At the very least, it was one of the first to have an open world. Previous games had restricted Spider-Man to specific levels, but now you could swing around Manhattan whenever you wanted. It got that feeling of freedom everyone wants from a Spider-Man game, and it just felt right, and swinging was just a part of it. The world was filled with side quests like pizza delivery and stopping groups of criminals. It gave that feeling of exploration that no other superhero game at the time had really achieved. You were living in a city, not just a level. A lot of Spider-Man 2's reviews didn't really praise the writing. I know what you're thinking, it's based on a movie. How could that writing be bad? Well... Even when I promised I wouldn't, I just wanted to love you. I'm lost without you, Gwen. Peter, that is the cheesiest speech I've ever heard. Gwen! We'll get to that game eventually. Spider-Man 2 is brilliant for so many reasons, but it was arguably the first game that put an equal emphasis on Peter Parker as much as it did on Spider-Man. Other games had tried to do this, but none of them had intertwined the two so beautifully. The relatability of Peter Parker comes to life from the understanding that the superpowers don't immediately improve his life. In fact, they make it worse. 
He tries to balance his personal life, his financial issues, and his identity, all the while trying to save New York. I'm really sorry, Mr. Dickovich. You know, all I got is this 20 for the rest of the week. <sighs> Sorry he doesn't pay the rent, and don't try to sneak past me. I can't imagine trying to save New York while trying to pay off my student loans. The layout of Spider-Man 2's story and mission design used his knowledge so well. If Peter was assigned a photography assignment, Spider-Man had to carry it out. If Peter needed the money, Spider-Man delivered pizzas. The two never really felt like different characters the whole time, and they were one and the same. A really impressive achievement for a game that came out in 2004, and a game that was based on a movie. On top of that, the game had a system that let you upgrade Spider-Man's stats using currency called Hero Points. You could only get them through collectibles or side quests, meaning that as Peter Parker was growing as a character, so was the player. Literally. It basically wrote the blueprints on how to make a Spider-Man game, and it got insanely good reviews with both fans and critics that love it. At least on the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. For some reason, another studio made the PC version, and it's a completely different game. Spider-Man 2 had nailed so much of what the character meant to so many people, and it did it so effortlessly and it made it look easy. Luckily or unfortunately, Spider-Man 3 would come out and remind us that we were taking it for granted. The game was clearly rushed to meet its deadline of releasing the same day as the movie. The combat system is entirely button mashing. The game's filled with glitches and frame rate issues that were never fixed, and just look at it. The game's hideous. Overall, it was designed in a way that no one wanted. All they had to do was give us Spider-Man 2, but bigger. Even the web swinging that Frisham perfected was gone. But for some reason, the game's tutorial so pretended like it was in there. Now, the trick with swinging is that you need something to swing from. That's right, you can't just swing from empty space. You're not that good yet. So make sure that there's a building or something nearby when you want to swing. Got it? Good. If you hold down R2, you do the web swing. Quick question, what am I swinging off of considering I'm in a park? Mmm, game. No, I don't know what you're thinking. It was 2007. I like the game. Give it a break. Well, a year later, Activision and Treyarch put out Spider-Man Web of Shadows. It was open world, had a much deeper combat, and could be done on the ground, in the air, or even on the wall. It had a branching story with different choices that affected the gameplay, and a reputation system that changed whether you helped protect or destroy the city. It was basically the infamous and prototype games an entire year before they came out. There was a great core at the heart of all these Spider-Man games, and no release during this period really capitalized as much on it as they could have. This is most likely due to publishers thinking that even a bad game was sold because of the Spider-Man name. Shadow Dimensions came along and that was incredible, but it wasn't even the same sort of experience. It was a great linear story, but it wasn't the high budget adventure that Peter Parker deserved. It was a bittersweet release anyway, because as good as it was, it marked the last good Spider-Man game that we'd get for eight years. Eight years. Release after release, every single game completely missed the point of what the fans actually wanted. Spider-Man became restricted to only fighting games. <laughs> People love Spider-Man, right. what can I say? On original mobile games and the amazing Spider-Man games. I told you we'd get to it eventually. The Amazing Spider-Man games were the first ones on the PS4 and Xbox One generation. Arkham Asylum had already legitimized hero games and their potential, but these games were still nothing more than rushed movie tie-ins. They even started stripping back gameplay just to make the game look prettier. And they weren't even good at that. I mean, look at this UI. It's practically unfinished. It looks worse than the Spider-Man 2 map screen from 2004. It seems ridiculous to criticize a game known for a mechanic like swinging on its graphics. But according to Jamie Fristrom, graphics are core to the Spider-Man experience. To sell the Spider-Man experience, you need all the cosmetic stuff. You need particle systems, animations, motion blur, wind trails. Suddenly we feel the danger the hero feels. You wouldn't feel any danger if a pendulum, if a sphere or a pendulum bob falls from a great height, but when a human even if he's a cartoon, falls from a great height, you feel for him, you feel it in your gut. I don't know why, but we have this empathy for the cartoon character. The most effective way on explaining how badly the Amazing Spider-Man games miss the point is just by looking at the mechanic that they added called Web Rush. You press one button and Spider-Man starts running off by himself to wherever you were looking. It's basically a very drawn out cutscene. It was impressive once, but Where's the game? No one bought it just to stare at Spider-Man. They wanted to be Spider-Man. The difficulty was a joke as well. Everything had become more simplified to the point of being impossible to fail. Which makes no sense, because at the core of Peter Parker's character is him wrestling with the guilt that he failed Uncle Ben. Peter. Oh. 
But if it's easy to be him and save the city, almost all of his vulnerability is raw, and what you're left is not really Spider-Man. It's just a guy delivering badly written lines in a suit. In the Polygon review of Spider-Man 2, Justin McElroy said, I've accepted that there's probably never gonna be truly a great Spider-Man game. And for the next few years, it looked like the Spider-Man that fans had loved was dead. Parker! Parker, are you there? Peter! Peter! Or so it seemed. At E3 2016, Sony unveiled a 60 second teaser of the Insomniac PS4 game. The trailer doesn't actually show anything that the previous game hadn't done, but the thought of a competent developer paired with a less greedy publisher than Activision was enough to send the hype train full steam ahead. Behind the scenes, the same sort of thing was going on. Insomniac was approached to make a game based off of any Marvel property that they wanted, and they chose Spider-Man. For the last 20 years, Insomniac only made original IPs. Going to a licensed game was a huge risk, but it was one based on passion. Everybody involved wanted to make this game, including the voice actors. What was so exciting about being Spider-Man for you? Showing up to work and getting to be Spider-Man. You know, like there was no, I don't want to go to work today because work was being Spider-Man. In other words, the developers weren't only the fans of the character, but also the fans of the other Spider-Man games. And you want to see this in the DNA of the game. A lot of the techniques that made Spider-Man 2 so good are also on the PS4 version, just as unlockable in the skill trees, like the web zip, the charge jump, and even the air tricks. And the swinging was finally good again. It wasn't exactly the same, but they made the right choice. Each web does anchor to an actual physical point again, and the game uses an algorithm to always select the point that conserves the most momentum. The higher end of the difficulty curve that Spider-Man 2 swinging was cut, but in exchange, moving around the city without colliding into anything was so much easier. Insomniac had to utilize loads of graphical tricks to create a sensation of speed. Cameras pulling in and out, motion blur, and loading detail into the city to create the illusion of height. These techniques were needed because of how slow hard drive speeds were on the PS4. If you went too fast, the map wouldn't even have loaded in time. Which is probably why a lot of the PS5 marketing is based around the new Spider-Man games and its SD. Their understanding of Peter and the Spider-Man's relationship was incredible as well. They purposefully kept the two in sync whenever one side would fail, the other one would succeed. Even when it comes to the voice acting, Spider-Man's delivery in general is more confident, and Peter's is softer. I definitely get a little younger when I'm Peter, and a little more butch when I'm, when I'm Spider-Man but they still have to share, they can't be totally different. The entire story moves at perfect pacing, and every set piece more than justifies its time in the game. Insomniac managed to touch on all the core themes of Spider-Man, like power, sacrifice, and identity, all in their own unique way. In the same way Peter passed on the generational torch of Miles Morales, Treyarch did the same thing to Insomniac. And it looks like we're gonna be going in for another golden age of the Spider-Man in general. I mean, at one point, Sony was planning an Aunt May standalone film set in World War II. <laughs> what? And now we have a Spider-Verse sequel, two games on the way from a great developer, and another Marvel movie. The PS4 Spider-Man was definitely perfected for what it was going for, but its aim was polishing. It wasn't trying to innovate anything at all. The real question is, where does Insomnia go from here? Maybe sticking too close to the original formula was a mistake? I mean, Spider-Man's rogues gallery is one of the best in superhero history, so do we have to have another Rhino in every single game? What would you want to see Spider-Man do next? I think the Spider-Verse is still pretty rich with potential, and paired with the PS5's power, they could do something pretty crazy. Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And with all that being said, I hope you guys stay safe, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day. Oh, <laughs>